I'll keep this video very... I keep... Hi, I'm Marcus and I play the shakuhachi. A few weeks ago I posted a video on the basics of notation, in particular the kinko notation for shakuhachi, and I noticed when I made that video that it's actually a very broad topic, so I decided to split it into multiple videos. Today I'm going to address the next issue, which is the notation of rhythm. And to say this right from the start, most classical shakuhachi repertoire doesn't actually have a fixed pulse, so there is not really a need to notate rhythm, at least not in my lineage. But the typical songs that you will play first when you start playing the shakuhachi are folk tunes or melodies that you know very well, so it's easier to play them. And of course these have rhythms, so you should have a basic understanding of how rhythm is notated as well. There's more to rhythm notation than I will cover in this video, however I'm hoping to give you a good start so that you can play your first tunes. The basis of rhythm is that you have a steady pulse, so this is a very simple steady pulse. And most pieces, most music is in a so-called 4-4 four, four meter, which means that for every bar, for every segment, you have four beats. So one, two, three, four. The next thing to be aware of is that you can subdivide these beats into smaller segments. So you have one and two and three and four and. Okay, so you have the beat itself, where I'm counting the number, and you have the point of time in between where I say and. One and two and three and four and. Okay, so in this instance, I'm also closing my hands and opening my hands. Maybe that's another good cue for you to follow along. This is already the basis for shakuhachi rhythm notation in the kinko way of writing it. So you can distinguish these two kinds of beats, if you like, the ones where I'm counting the number and I'm clapping and the ones where I have my hands apart and which is in between the numbers where I say and. For Western music we usually call this downbeat and upbeat. So the downbeat is where I count the number one, two, three, four and the upbeat is where I count and, 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 and. This idea of having a downbeat and an upbeat is at the core of the kinko rhythm notation. Except that of course we don't use downbeat and upbeat but we call them omote, which means front, and ura, which means back. So the idea is pretty much the same when you lean forward, it has, it has more weight than if you lean back, which has less weight, just the same as you have with the downbeat, which has more weight than the upbeat, which has less weight. The next thing to get for the shakuhachi notation is that you actually don't go front and back, but you go right and left. So the strong beats, the downbeat, the omote, is on the right, whereas the weak beat, the upbeat, the ura, is on the left. And the way this is notated on the paper is that you put dots next to the notes. You put a dot on the right side for the downbeats, for the omoti beats, and you put a dot on the left side of the symbols for the ura beats, for the upbeats. To make my life a bit easier, I'm going to use examples from this very nice PDF booklet which is by Yoshikazu Iwamoto, uh, which is freely available. So for example, go to the website of the European Shakuachi Society that you can download it. It's free, so that's very nice. Um, the thing about this is that it doesn't have any textual explanations, so you will actually need to get a teacher to make sense of this. But it has some very nice material in here. And so I'm going through some of the examples that he has on his page number two. And in this example number one, you can see that you have the note ro, which I already discussed in my first video, which means that you have all the holes closed on the instrument. This is the lowest note that you can play on the shakuhachi. Now we have this symbol repeated multiple times and we have this dot on the right side and we have this dot on the left side, right side, left side, right side, left side. This means that in this instance, we count right beat, left beat, right beat, left beat, right beat, left beat. They're all equally distant time-wise. The Western way of counting this would be one and two and three and. Okay, so we don't have a full bar in this example, but we only have three beats, three full beats. 
Having these dots on the right side and on the left side is actually a very nice visual aid to guide you in where the beats fall. Because if you're not counting by clapping your hands or by tapping your foot, as is very common in the West, for example, you can use a pendulum movement with your upper body. Of course, if it gets faster, this becomes a bit <laughs> awkward. But you can use this to count right beat, left beat, right beat, left beat, right beat, left beat. And this way you can align your body position with the dot on the page. So let me demonstrate this by playing this. This is raw, all holes closed, and I'm repeating notes by uh, tapping the first hole. So it goes like this. Okay, so you can see that my body is on the right where there is a right dot and it goes to the left where there is a left dot. Of course, this doesn't really work very well when you have a very fast tempo, you need to count very fast, but it's very good to actually find out the rhythm of a piece. However, this is not mandatory, so you can do this, you can tap your foot, you can count in your head, you can go front and back. If you find that easier, or you can go down and up. Any way you like. It's just that this pendulum idea is a very nice alignment between what's written on the page and with your own body movement. So sometimes it's easier to figure out what you're supposed to do. Okay. On to the next example. This already demonstrates one of the most confusing aspects of this kind of rhythm notation, which is that while the right beats are always indicated, the left beats are only indicated when, let's say, something interesting happens. Okay, so if nothing happens, if you just hold a note, the left beat is not notated. You can see this in the second example, where we have a dot on the right side, then there is no dot on the left side before we have the next dot on the right side again. This means we're just holding this note with the dot on the right side while the left dot is happening, so to speak, and then we continue with the dot on the right. So let me demonstrate this. Again, I'm doing the pendulum so you can follow along with the notation. So as you could see, I didn't do a repetition when it was time for the beat on the left side, when I moved to the left. The next point is that if you have a note that lasts for multiple beats, you just group the dots on the right side. So you can see this in the third example, where for the first note there are two dots next to the row symbol. So this means you start the note on the right beat, left beat, which is not notated, nothing happens, right beat, nothing happens, and then for the left beat you do the first repetition. Okay, let me again demonstrate. One thing that you should also be aware of is that the spacing that is indicated here on the page, I think is just for educational purposes. So usually you would just squash this all together. So for example, if you're looking at an actual notation, you see there is no white space between any of the notes. You can also see this in the example number five, where you have right beat, left beat, right beat, left beat, so only four beats. but uh, it's the same spacing as we had for the six beats initially. So I always sum up this, whether to write a left dot or not to write a left dot, that you don't write a left dot if nothing of interest happens. So the left dot is always optional. Um, and if the left dot is not written, then nothing happens there. This is not always how it's done, but that's a basic good rule of thumb I found <laughs> over the years deciphering this kind of notation. You may also have noticed that uh, we not only have the symbol itself, so the fingering, the row, and we have the dots on the right on the, and on the left, but we also have these vertical lines going through the symbols. This is the same idea as we have in the West for notating eighth notes or sixteenth notes or thirty-second notes. If you have one line, this is just like an eighth note in Western notation. If you have two lines, this indicates a sixteenth note. So. If we're now looking at example number six here, you can see there is a dot on the right side and the row has two lines through it. Then there is another row before we get to the third row, which is on the upbeat, on the beat on the left. For doing this pendulum movement, 
This basically means you play when you're in the middle. So I'll do this very slowly. As I said earlier, this is just a very general, very simple introduction to the rhythm notation. There's a bit more to it, so I'm going to leave it at that. One thing I wanted to point out as well is what you see in the example number eight. I'm not going to really go into very much detail here, but I thought it might be helpful, at least if you're already a bit more familiar with rhythm notation in general. Uh, in the example number eight, we have the row and a dot on the right. Then we have this empty triangle on the left and then we have another row before we get to the third row on the right beat again. This is a way in which we can notate what in the West we would call dotted notes. If we subdivide this first beat into 16th notes, as we just did, then we have the row on the right beat, nothing happens in the middle, nothing happens on the left beat, then we have the next note on the middle beat, when we go back to the right and then we have another repetition on the right. So this basically means the left dot is notated here, despite of what I earlier said, but it's written as an empty triangle to indicate that nothing happens on the left beat. So if I play this first beat very slowly, it goes like this. So this is the equivalent to having a dotted eighth note in Western notation. I'm going to leave it at that for a general introduction to the rhythm notation. Let's just have a very quick look at the first piece so you can see how this works in the wild. This piece starts on Re and we start on the right side with the right dot. Then we do a repetition on the left side for the next Re. We do a repetition on the right side no left dot is notated, so nothing happens here. Then we have a right dot for the two, nothing happens on the left. A repetition of the two, nothing happens. Right dot for re, nothing happens on the left. But then we have right dot for re repetition, left dot re repetition, right dot next re repetition, and then nothing for the left dot. This is everything up to the first rest, which is this circle here. If I play this, it goes like this. Um, if you want to see me play the whole piece, um, I have a series on play-alongs and I just started uh, playing these Iwamoto pieces as well. So uh, please check that out. I'm going to link this. I think it's up here. Um, anyway, uh, check that out if you uh, find that useful. I'm also indicating the notation there so you can follow along uh, and hopefully see what you're supposed to do. So maybe that's helpful for you as well. Okay, as I said at the very start, <laughs> Shakuhachi notation is a mess. Um, I still stand with this statement. Um, there is, of course, a logic to the way the notation is made and the way it is used, of course. But uh, for me, at least with my background in Western music, I still, I'm still struggling sometimes to really figure out where exactly the beats fall and what exactly to do. So again, um, I'm repeating this point a lot. Really to learn Shakuhachi, you have to have instruction because the notation only tells you half the story. So you can get some things of notation, but you don't really learn properly to play the instrument. This is not to discourage you, it's just to make clear that this is a starting point and there is still a lot more that needs to be said about notation as well as about playing shakuhachi, of course. But I still hope you found this very brief introduction to rhythm notation and the Kinko lineage uh, interesting and useful. And as always, please subscribe, like the video, ring the bell, um, and you will be notated. You will and you will be notified when I release a new video. And yeah, if you have ideas for new videos, for things you'd like me to explain, please leave them in the comments. Um, I read all the comments and I'm trying to make this as interesting for everybody who watches my videos as I possibly can. And thanks for watching and I see you in my next video. Bye. This idea of having a downbeat and an upbeat is at the core of Kinko rhythm notation.